Okay, so ironically, in a consciousness colloquium, I'm going to try and convince you that you should stop caring. Right? Give it up. Um, the talk is drawn from the contents of actually not the forthcoming book, but a recent book, and I, I can't resist but share the cover with you, which I think is so cool. Um, Human and Animal Minds, it's called The Consciousness Questions Laid to Rest. And the two questions are, what is consciousness and which animals are conscious? And I'll talk about both of those um, today. So here's an outline what I'll do. I mean, first of all, I'll talk about the kind of consciousness that's in question. Um, then I'll spend a few sections talking about what I think is now the best reductive theory of phenomenal consciousness, which is our target. And I'll then turn to the question of whether the, there is that sort of question, sorry, there is that sort of consciousness in other species. And I'll argue that there is no fact to the matter. It's not that some species are phenomenally conscious and some aren't, but there is simply no fact to the matter for most species. And then I'll say, well, who cares anyway? And I think one shouldn't care anyway. Now, should I be admitting these people as we go along or are you doing it? You're doing it, I guess. It pops up on my screen too, but okay. Okay, so kinds of consciousness. What do people mean by consciousness? Well, unfortunately, lots of different things and that really bedevils the field. People slide from one to the other and back again and it's sometimes not at all clear what they have in mind. Um, so one way we use the term conscious is just awake, right? He regained consciousness. Um, the, the, the creature was made unconscious. Right? And almost all creatures have wake sleep cycles. It's not at all controversial that some creatures are conscious in that sense. Um, there's lots of things to study scientifically. It's still not fully understood why animals have wake and sleep cycles. I mean, even fruit flies do. Um, sleep seems to serve multiple purposes. Um, but anyway, so there's deep scientific questions there, but nothing to do with philosophy or not much. Or you can talk about a creature being conscious of something or not conscious of something, right? So the the cat is conscious of the mouse exiting its hole. Well, that just means it sees it, it's aware of it, right? So this is just perceptual consciousness um, where the creature is perceptually sensitive to and recognizes the object in question. Again, not at all controversial that creatures are conscious in that sense. It's not problematic that lots of creatures have perceptual systems and are perceptually aware of the things around them. Um, slightly more demanding, there's, um, you can switch now from talking about creatures being conscious to mental states being conscious ones, or a mental state being unconscious. And in one use of the term, a, a mental state is conscious if it's available to reasoning, planning, report, globally available, as it's sometimes said, or um, access conscious in the terminology that, that Ned Block made famous. Um, in the more contemporary cognitive science theories, people talk about a global workspace, right? So when a mental state enters the global workspace, it thereby becomes available to reasoning, planning, and report. Right? Um, and the global workspace is just working memory, I think, or at least a large part of working memory. Um, all three of those are functionally defined. Right? You, can, you can give a full third person account of what's going on when a creature is conscious in either of the first two senses or when a mental state is conscious in the third sense. There's no deep problem about the existence of any of those, except insofar as you might think mentality in general is a bit of a problem. But then there's the like something stuff, right? Um, what is a mental state like? What does it feel like on the inside? Generally called phenomenal consciousness. What's the, what's the 
Um, this is a, a first personal notion in order to explain phenomenal consciousness to people. As Ned Block pointed out, back when he contrasted it with access consciousness, all you can really do is draw people's attention to their own phenomenally conscious states. You say things like, well, think of a case where you're listening to the timbre of a trumpet and just focus on what that experience is like for you. That's what it is to be phenomenally conscious. Or think of a case where you're looking at a bright color and think about what it's like to see that color. And that's what it is to have a phenomenally conscious state and so on. And it's phenomenal consciousness that's supposed to give rise to the hard problem. Right? Um, this is the problem that arises because it looks like there's an explanatory gap between all the other stuff, including numbers one, two, and three, right? the other kinds of consciousness and phenomenal consciousness. For whatever scientific story you tell, it looks like you can say, well, yeah, but I still don't see why any of that stuff, right? So states being made globally available to reasoning, planning, and report should feel like this, should have this feel to it that the states have in my own first personal case. And that's the explanatory gap. There's also the famous possibility of zombies, that it looks like you can conceive of a creature that has whatever you specify in the way of, of um, functionally divine, defined contentful states, right? States that are available to reasoning, planning, report, and so on. And yet it's all dark on the inside in the sense that there's no feel on the inside. There's no phenomenal consciousness. Um, okay, so, so I'm talking about phenomenal consciousness here. And from here on in, it's just phenomenal consciousness that's at stake. I'm first of all gonna explain what I think is the best theory of the neural correlates of phenomenal consciousness before I try and turn that into a, a fully explanatory theory. And that's global workspace theory. Um, global workspace theory is the theory that mental states become phenomenally conscious when they enter the global workspace, when they become access consciousness, right? So this is arguing for a kind of identity between phenomenal consciousness and access consciousness, or at least that the one is the neural correlate of the other. And the evidence for it comes from a number of different sources. You can, most of them looking at the contrast between when a mental state is conscious versus it's unconscious and looking to see what happens in the brain in those two conditions. So you can use um, inattentional and change blindness somewhat less common than, than um, many of the others because it's, it's less easy to control. I'll, I'll tell you a version of inattentional blindness that can be controlled in a minute. Um, binocular rivalry has been used a lot. If you show different images to the two eyes, um, as in the, the top picture there where you, you show one eye a picture of a face on a green background, the other eye a picture of a house on a red background, you'd think you'd see a kind of mismatch, mismatch of the two, right? A sort of overlaid thing as in the very top image, but you don't. What you see is one, and then as a result of neural adaptation, after a few seconds, it flips to the other. And then after a few seconds more, it flips back to the first, right? So you're keeping the input completely constant there's the same stimulus being provided to the visual system throughout. So the input is completely controlled and yet conscious experience flips from one to the other and back again, okay? And there are various um, objective measures that you can form of when it's flipping. And you can look to see what happens in the brain to a content when it's conscious as opposed to when it's not conscious. Not conscious. Um, and some of this work has been more recent than Dehaene's book and, and is really very elegant. Right. Also commonly employed has been masking of one sort or another, right? Backward masking, metacontrast masking. I won't bother to explain the metacontrast bit, but the backward one is illustrated here um, where you flash up, say, a face for a very short period of time, 16 milliseconds, 16 thousandths of a second, not very much, then a a gap which you can you can jitter um, the the extent of, which is this stimulus onset asynchrony. That's what COA SOA stands for. 
and then a masking, a, a sort of noisy, just nothing much. And depending upon this interval and the vividness of the initial image, um, sometimes the person will report that they saw it, sometimes they'll report that they didn't. And you can actually jitter this to, for each individual subject so that they'll report keeping the stimulus exactly the same and keeping the intervals exactly the same from trial to trial, they'll report seeing it on about 50% of the trials. And then again, you can look and see what happens in the brain on the ones where they did see it versus the ones where they didn't see it. And everything about the input was exactly the same in both those cases. Um, and then finally, there's the inattentional blink, which is a kind of inattentional blindness, which has a structure something like this, starting up in the top left. You focus on the cross, there's then just a, a letter and short gaps in between. And your first task, go down to here, is at the end, you're going to have to say what the blue stimulus was, whether it was a letter or a digit, right? So that pops up next briefly. And then there's a string of other things. And you might also be asked to report whether there was a O present or not. And what happens in, in, attention, in the inattentional blink is that because you're attending to this, attention sort of blinks and you don't see the item that it comes a bit further on. Or, and again, you can titrate the parameters so that people see the second stimulus on about 50% of the trials, everything kept the same, and you can look at what happens in the brain. Okay, so what does happen in the brain? Well, here's an image from one of Duhaine's papers, not from the book, I think, um, showing a contrast using masking um, for words, right? So in the case where you've got unconscious perception of the words, masked words that don't reach the level of consciousness, people say they didn't see them, you get a little bit of activity here in the fusiform gyrus, the visual word form area, Right. And maybe a little bit up here in um, primary motor cortex where be active when you actually read the word, okay, when you read it aloud. Um, in contrast, when the stimulus is conscious, you get a lot more activity here. Green is more active in fusiform gyrus. And you get activity in parietal cortex up here in dorsolateral prefrontal and in um, ventrolateral prefrontal and actually a number of other areas too, but those are the main ones that show up from this experiment. And here in the middle, you've just got um, a look at the difference in the electrical activity and in um, fusiform gyrus between the two conditions. So you can already see this looks a bit like global broadcasting, right? That the content of the word is reaching much more broadly through cortex in the conscious case than in the unconscious. Here's a sort of diagramic representation from Dehane and other of Dehane's papers um, showing the same kind of thing that here on the left, we've got subliminal processing, taking the visual case, it's projected first to primary visual cortex, and then you get some forward processing through temporal cortex and up through parts of um, the parietal visual cortex and some reverberations that last here for a little bit, right? And then they die out. In the consciousness condition, you get the same initial processing, but then you get this, he sometimes talks about it as a sort of global ignition. You get activity in prefrontal cortex up here in, in dorsolateral prefrontal and also in superior parietal. And this reverberates and reverberates for a longer time. In principle, it can go on for a long time because you can hold the representation in working memory once it's got there. Right? Once it's been globally broadcast, you can keep it globally broadcasting by continuing potentially to pay attention to it. Down here, we've got representations of the activity under different levels of masking. So I'll take just a minute about this. The different colors here represent the different levels of masking. So this is really easily visible, the yellow one. Down the blue is just, you can't see it at all. And then easier to, to, I mean, sorry, sometimes you might see it and have a sense there was something there, but you don't really see it. This is a threshold, you'll see it half the time. And then, yeah, you can just make it out and so on. In early visual areas, you get essentially the same activity in all those conditions, 
at around 100 milliseconds. So about 100, a thousandth, sorry, a tenth of a second after the stimulus goes on, the light flashes or whatever it is, you get a bump of activity in the back of the cortex that's common across all the conditions. And then it dies down again. It's, it, it bumps up and it dies down. Note that at about 350 milliseconds, in the consciousness case only, you get another bump of activity, right? The, the unconscious cases are flat here. The, you had the bump up initially with the stimulus and then it's died away. But you get another bump of activity when the ignition goes global and you've got this kind of reverberating activity involving the whole of cortex. Something a bit similar with the higher visual areas looking up here now in temporal cortex, you get in this case, a graded bump of activity at about 180, 200 milliseconds, right? So the wholly unconscious case, you do get activity there, right? So there's some activity going on here, but it's not very strong and doesn't last very long and it dies away and stays died away. In the consciousness cases, you get more activity, dies away, and then you get another bump again when you get the reverberating activity from prefrontal cortex at about 400 milliseconds. Prefrontal areas, nothing at all initially, but then in the consciousness cases, you get this bump of activity around 350, 400 milliseconds. Okay. So on this view, that's how long it takes for a stimulus to become conscious. It's, it's a little bit less than half a second from light hitting your retina to you becoming aware of what the stimulus was that was presented. And what seems to make it conscious or correlate with being conscious is this widespread global activity, the global workspace stuff. Okay. So there's a lot more to be said, um, but I'm just gonna take for granted that this is the correct account right? and, and press on. There's other accounts you can trust it with and say, well, why is this better than that one? But suppose we assume the global workspace or the access consciousness view is at least the physical correlate of phenomenal consciousness, right? That when you have a phenomenally conscious mental state, what's going on in your brain is you've got this reverberating contentful activity that involves a widespread um, network of, of regions. Actually the same as you have when um, you do working memory tasks too. But still, you know, this by itself, doesn't solve the problem of phenomenal consciousness because you can still raise the explanatory gap for that. You can say, all right, I understand that. You've got these contents running around all over the place in the brain, right? They're globally available, but why does it feel like anything, right? Why isn't it, why isn't it still, as it were, dark on the inside? And you can still imagine a version of the zombie workspace. You can say, yeah, I can imagine a creature that has all that stuff running around in its, in its cortex, but for whom there's nothing that it's like to have those states, right? So there's still the problem. And many people have been tempted to think, well, that's because there are some special first person properties over and above the physical ones, over and above the properties that are involved in representation and computation and neural processing and all the stuff that you can talk about in third person terms. There's some purely first personal properties, sometimes called qualia. And I want to say, no, that's not, that's, that's no reason to think that. All we've got is first person versus third person modes of thinking about those global word space contents, right? That when they, when those contents are, are globally broadcast, you can either think about them from the outside, as I just have, right? Those are contents that have been widely broadcast to a number of different systems in the brain, right? Or you yourself as an agent can think about those very same contents that become available to you to think about when they're globally broadcast. Right? And so you can have a first personal thought about the same state, the same content. So I want to argue, and I'll try and convince you of this over the next few slides, that the explanatory gap is merely a conceptual gap. It's not a gap between the, there's no real gap among the properties involved. And I'll try and convince you by the same token that zombies are conceivable, but not possible, metaphysically impossible. Okay. 
So this is the phenomenal concept strategy that, that I think Michael Tai first employed in, in back in 1995, and it's been um, elaborated by a number of people since. My own take on it is quite similar to many others, including Jesse Prince. Um, I think that the concepts that we form that give rise to the problem that we'll call phenomenal concepts are higher order acquaintance-based indexicals, right? So they're indexical thoughts that you can form about your experience. So higher order because they're thoughts that are about mental states of yours, okay? Um, so in the famous case of Mary, who's brought up in her black and white room and never sees color and now steps out, she might think a thought like, oh, right, so this is what it's like to see red. So here's the indexical bit, right, the this, which is referring to an experiential state that she now has, a state that represents red, okay? And it's representing it by virtue of being in that state, by virtue of acquaintance with that state, you might say. And I'll come back to what acquaintance is in just a moment. Or, you know, you could think a more generalized thought. You might think as, as one thinks more often as one gets older, um, when I die, all this will disappear. Meaning, of course, not the world, right? The world will stay there and still go on, but, but this, the experience that one has of it, will be gone, they'll be, you know, it's a blank, it's nothing, there's nothing there, right? Um, and again, you've got the higher order indexical thought about your own experience, about your own representational states on, on this view. Now, what's distinctive of these indexicals is that they've got no conceptual connections with physical or representational concepts. And that means they can enable you to think the puzzling thoughts, right? You can think there could be a global workspace with contents in it without this being there, right? There could be a global workspace containing a representation of red without this, where the this now is the indexical that picks out an experience of red, but now picked out by an indexical, not descriptively as an experience of red. And likewise, you can think the thought, there could be a creature exactly like me physically, but lacking this, the experience in general that you'll lose when you die, okay? Um, and what enables you to think those thoughts is not that there's any special properties that you have when you're phenomenally conscious, it's rather the special concepts that you have that, that you can think about, you can use to think about your phenomenally conscious states with. And acquaintance here is nothing metaphysically weird or, 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 or special. It's just the availability of those workplace contents to conceptual systems. So it's the very same availability relation that's there when you think about redness itself. So when you think, oh, that's a nice shade of red. I'll have that for my walls, right? When you think that thought, there's a representation of red, which is available to conceptual systems enabling you to be acquainted with that representation, right? It's, it's immediately available. And it's just that same availability that enables you to think, this is what it's like, right? Now, notice that what, what one, one thing that you can say in favor of this way of looking at it is that once you understand this account of what a phenomenal concept is, right? A higher order acquaintance-based indexical. Then you'll realize that zombies would have them, right? Because they have representational states. They're capable of thinking. They're capable of thinking about their representational states, right? Putting this all in the third person. And so they're capable of thinking thoughts like, this is what it's like to see red. And so a zombie would be able to conceive of a zombie version of it itself, just as we can conceive of a zombie. It would be able to think the thought. Indeed, it wouldn't count as a zombie if it wasn't, because zombies are supposed to be behaviorally and everything equivalent to oneself, right? The zombie can think, well, there could be a creature that's exactly like me physically and functionally and representationally, but nevertheless lacks this 
the this that will disappear when I finally die, right? Um, and now you can kind of bring it back home and realize that, well, since I can think that thought without, uh, sorry, since the zombie can think that thought without there being any special properties inside the zombie, the fact that I can think that thought doesn't show there's any special properties inside me either. It's just coming from the distinctive concepts that we've got. So I think the conclusion we should draw from the phenomenal consciousness, sorry, phenomenal concept strategy is not just that phenomenal consciousness correlates with global broadcast content, but that it is, right? That there's an identity there. It is nothing over and above, phenomenal consciousness is nothing over and above globally broadcast content. I put the non-conceptual in there because that's what I actually think, but um, there's a whole other debate about, about um, cognitive phenomenology, that you know, whether concepts and thoughts themselves can have phenomenology intrinsically, or um, and I, I, I don't need to get into that here, it would just be a distraction. I, I actually think it's non-conceptual content that matters here, but if, if you disagree, it won't matter for these purposes. Okay, so, so the upshot then, if phenomenal consciousness is globally broadcast content, is that, well, there's no essentially first person properties, right? There's nothing over and above content and functional role, right? The global broadcasting component, there's, there's the contents that get globally broadcast and period, that's it, that's all there is. And so nothing special enters the world with phenomenal consciousness, right? Um, you know, nothing lights up or any of that kind. You just get content that enters into novel functional relationships, enabling more or less complicated thoughts in the presence of that content. And, you know, at the height of evolution, you get the possibility that philosophers can get worried about their own phenomenal states and give rise to, the, you know, make up the hard problem. But there's nothing new there that enables them to think that thought, except the capacity to think these higher order indexical thoughts. But what about phenomenal consciousness in non-human animals then? I suppose that's the correct account of phenomenal consciousness in humans. We can raise the question, well, but what about animals? What about, what about cats and dogs and chickens and, and octopuses? And, are any of them phenomenally conscious? Um, well, if you think of it in third person terms, um, the network, the system that gives rise to phenomenal consciousness in humans will be present in degrees as you look across species. Right? So the human type global workspace itself emerges by degrees. Right? Um, the global broadcasting architecture varies by degrees across species. Because if you say, so, you know, when, when contents are globally broadcast, what are they broadcast to? Well, a number of things. To systems that enable verbal report. I have an experience of red, you can say, or I saw that one, you can say, right? To higher order awareness, to the awareness of an experience, which may or may not be verbally reported to executive function systems so that you can then intentionally bear that content in mind, keep it active once it enters the global workspace, say, or um, make plans on the basis of what you're seeing. It can give rise to long-term memories of what you saw. It gives rise to sustained affective reactions. If you see consciously something emotive, um, you, you may have a sustained emotional reaction, the same thing subliminally priming you will give rise to an emotional reaction. You know, you may, you may find yourself in an aroused state without knowing why, but it fades away rapidly, right? It's not sustained without consciousness. So the global broadcasting thing has a number of functions. It's got a number of components. Um, some of these are human specific, verbal report is. Executive function isn't. Um, but it itself is multi-component, multi-functional, has a number of aspects to it, which look like they too can vary across 
species. So what's, what's often described as executive function actually breaks down into lots of different things. And it's, it's to some extent unclear how many mechanisms there are involved that might vary independently of one another, right? So executive function is involved when you select which action to execute, right? Lift it with the left hand or the right hand. It's involved when you mentally rehearse an action, you practice it in your head, right? Or say something to yourself in a speech. Um, it's involved in inhibiting action, right? When you stop yourself from doing something. When you search memory for um, what you did on your last birthday. When you inhibit and try to suppress memories that you don't want to remember. When you form intentions for the future, when you, and you can see how it goes, right? There's a whole lot of different things that that fall under the ambit of um, executive function. And it's been heavily researched in humans, much harder to research across species, although there's been some. And we know, for example, that um, there's at least limited forms of executive function and that we can discern planning abilities in corvids like crows and in primates. Um, but it looks like what you've got here is, is a complicated mess of global workspace items, which might vary independently across species and certainly will vary by degrees as you look across species. Some of those components are gonna be really quite widespread. Um, so attentional selection, which is thought to be the main determinant for getting a content into the global workspace in the first place, which gets a content globally broadcast, you have to attend to it. It has this boosting and suppressing function it, 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 by focusing attention on a given neural representation, you boost and sharpen that and suppress the surrounds. And that's what gives rise to the global ignition that makes that content now globally available. And we know that aspects at least of that network are, are present in birds as well as mammals and that maybe all vertebrates share um, similar attentional selection mechanisms. Not so clear that all those creatures will have the same top-down control of attention that humans and, and probably other primates do, where you can intentionally hold an item in consciousness. Now, whenever you can do match to sample task, perhaps you get evidence of that, right? If you show an animal a symbol, and it goes away and it knows in a few seconds, it's gonna to have to match what it saw to what comes up on the screen later. It's got to try and hold a representation in mind of what it saw, right, to compare with what comes later. And if they solve that task in the way that humans would, then that would suggest some sort of top-down control of, of attentional mechanisms. But, you know, um, still is not fully clear. There's gonna be, Big differences in the conceptual abilities that creatures have. I mean, some species are conceptually rich. They have lots of categories and concepts. If you think of omnivores like bears and raccoons that eat all kinds of different things and know where to find it and so on, they're going to have a, they're going to divide the world in lots of, into lots of different kinds of thing and have concepts of those kinds. Some species much more limited, right? So carnivores that just eat a single source of prey, say. They don't need to carve the world into, they need to carve the world into edible and inedible, roughly speaking, and um, a bit more for things that you might mate with and so on, but um, not all the different kinds of thing that a bear would be able to distinguish. Um, some species perhaps can represent their own mental states as evidence of this, um, or represent mental states as evidence of this for primates. Um, less clear for self-knowledge, but um, believe that. And all of the component systems that make up the global workspace have degrees of internal complexity, right? That you can, can admit of greater or lesser richness inside and degrees of conceptual sophistication. So as you think about, you know, if you think, well, phenomenal consciousness is, at least in the human case, realized in the global workspace, contents in the global workspace, that system is multi-component. And as you look across species, what you're gonna see is something like 
a cross-cutting multi-dimensional similarity matrix. Right? You're going to find minds that are similar to the human global workspace along some dimensions, but dissimilar on others, and other minds that are similar on that other dimension, but not on the first set, and so on. Right? Um, and that I mean, it's not necessarily a problem in itself, but it, it means that there's no straightforward answer to the question, have they got the same system? Right? There's this, because what counts as the same system here? Okay, well, now I'm gonna try and convince you that when you raise the question of animal phenomenal consciousness, there's no fact to the matter. Okay. This is the first argument. The concept of phenomenal consciousness is basically first personal, right? I said that at the outset. It's you, 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 you get to know what phenomenal consciousness is by having your attention drawn to your own in, in internal states and thinking about them, okay? So when you ask, you know, the ba most basic fundamental way of asking the question of animal consciousness is to ask, does any animal have states like this? where the like this deploys a phenomenal concept that picks out some phenomenally conscious state of yours, right? Red or whatever, okay? And then we can ask, okay, so what counts as like this? Like, there's no special property that you're picking out. There's no qualia or anything on the view that I've been telling, right? So, so what fixes the extension of the concept like this? Not easy to see, right? The, the phenomenal concepts aren't governed by public norms. They're first person, private in a sense, right? You, you, you generate your own when you're invited to pay attention to your own experiences. They certainly aren't used as natural kind terms. You're not meaning to refer to the underlying reality, whatever it might be, right? Rather, you're just referring to the way it feels, as we say. So I think an analogy for, for how to think about um, the way the extension is fixed here comes like this. Imagine you're locating to a different city and you're wandering around a neighborhood with your partner and you really like it, right? It feels right. And you exclaim, we should live in a neighborhood like this, right? And as I'm thinking of this example, it's not any particular thing that makes the neighborhood feel right, right? It's not that it's got white picket fences and you've always wanted to be in a place that had white, you, you couldn't articulate what makes this neighborhood feel right to you. It just feels right, right? You've got this gut feeling, this is the sort of neighborhood I want to live in, right? Um, so if you ask, well, so what's the extension of the concept like this? Right? What fixes the extension? If you ask the question, consider this other place over here in the city. Is that place like this place? What fixes the answer? And I think it's this, that if that place were confronted by the dispositions to judge that underlie my current remark, right? I want to live in a neighborhood like this in the same background conditions, right? So if it's sunny here, it'd better be sunny there and so on, right? If it's confronted by the same dispositions to judge in the same background conditions, then it would be judged the same. And if it weren't judged the same, it would be different. Right? <coughs> so the thought is that it's the thinker's dispositions to judge, or at least dispositions to judge in a context that fix the extension. If that's the right way to think about it, then we can take that back to the case of phenomenal concepts too, and say, well, it's my dispositions to judge of a state that the state is like this, that fixes the extension of phenomenal consciousness, right? of the concept like this. Right? Um, and then when we ask, so are the cats percepts phenomenally conscious? What we're now asking is, are a cat's percepts like this, right? You deploy a phenomenal concept for one of your own conscious experiences and you think, well, has a cat got this, right? Or something like this, right? And now I'm proposing that to ask that question is to ask if the dispositions underlying my concept this were instantiated in the mind of a cat, then 
those dispositions would issue in a judgment. They would issue yes, yeah. Um, but now I think you can see there's a problem because the concept this is a pretty sophisticated concept. It requires at least capacities for higher order thought, right? For thinking about one's own experiences, probably capacities for reflective thinking more generally, for self-generated thoughts that aren't stimulus driven, and perhaps even capacities for language. I mean, we don't really know, but maybe phenomenal concepts are language dependent. And cats probably are intrinsically capable of those capacities, certainly language, but you know, it's not been fully experimentally determined, but probably higher order thought too and reflective thinking, right? So the counterfactual, if the dispositions underlying my concept were instantiated in the mind of a cat becomes unevaluable because the antecedent requires the cat's mind to be other than it actually is, right? Because when you say, if the dispositions underlying my concept were in the mind of the cat, now you're immediately supposing not the mind, the cat's mind, but a different kind of mind, a mind that's much more similar to my own mind, right? That has all these fancy capacities that underlie the dispositions to judge. Um, and so there's no fact to the matter. It's neither true nor false that the cat has states like this or doesn't have states like this, because either way, it presupposes that you could project my dispositions to judge into the cat's mind and keep that mind as it is. And that's a false presupposition. Right? So I, I think the question of animal phenomenal consciousness is a bit like the question, or well, the old, old chestnut have you stopped beating your wife yet? Asked of someone who has never beaten their spouse. Right? You can't answer yes or no. You say, yes, I have stopped. That implies that you did once beat her. If you say, no, I haven't stopped, that implies you're still beating her. There's no way to answer yes or no because it contains a false presupposition, the presupposition that you have at one time or another beaten your spouse. Right? And I think, at least in that respect, the question about phenomenal consciousness in the cat is similar. It contains a false presupposition. And so there's no yes, no answer possible. There's no fact to the matter here. Yeah. Well, but that was supposing that um, the only concept of phenomenal consciousness that we've got is this first personal introspective phenomenal concepts one. But, but isn't there also a third person concept of phenomenal consciousness. I mean, after all, I'm talking about it now, right? You, right? And yes, I think there is. I think you can say, well, it's whatever set of properties gives rise to the hard problem thought experiments, right? That's what picks out phenomenal consciousness as opposed to the other kinds of consciousness that we distinguished at the outset is that phenomenal consciousness is puzzling. It enables you to think about zombies and all that, right? Um, and the others aren't, or not in that way. Um, but then this doesn't really help much because you know, the full set of properties that gives rise to the hard problem thought experiments is human specific. It involves the capacity to think higher order thoughts and, and, and so on and so forth, all the stuff that goes into the explanation of the illusion of an explanatory gap. And the components of what gives rise to the hard problem will be present in animals to varying degrees. And yet I think there's nothing in our first personal phenomenal concepts that picks out some components rather than others, right? You can't say, oh, well, that one's irrelevant and this one's relevant because they're all present in the human case and um, there's nothing about our first person introspective grip on our own experiences that says some of this is more important than others. So I think any boundary much beyond the human case that would be stipulated, not discovered, right? There's, in fact, I think there's nothing to discover. And again, so there's no fact of the matter. Okay, just a little bit about cases that are sort of on the margin for whether there's a fact of the matter or not, and then I'll try and say you shouldn't care about any of this stuff. <laughs> um, so there are going to be cases where it's hard to know whether there's a fact of the matter or not. 
right? So in saying that there's no fact of the matter for the cat, I'm not saying that it's vague, right? On the contrary, I'm saying that there's a false presupposition. Um, but there'll be cases where it is genuinely vague whether the presupposition is false or not. Right? Um, and that's in part because it's not clear what's actually required for having phenomenal concepts. What is it? You know, does it require language, for example, or does it not? Right? Um, uh, one could spend a long time debating it if the question mattered. I don't think it does, but um, there's perhaps doubt about which creatures have the relevant capacities. Do chimpanzees have the capacity for higher order first person thought or not? Right? Do they have the capacity to think about their own experiences? Hard to tell. Um, there is some evidence that primates have mental state concepts and some people debate whether they're capable of so-called metacognition, thinking about their own mental states, but I think that's much more controversial. I've argued against it in some places. Um, then one can think about infants, quite different kind of marginal case. Right? They're capable of acquiring the capacities that underlie the problem of phenomenal consciousness, but they haven't yet got them. They can't yet think you know, is there an experience here like this? But they've got nascent versions of all the various capacities, whatever they are, right? Capacities for higher order thought, capacities for language and so on, which will develop into the full set. Um, what should we say about infants? You could raise a question about artificial minds. If you create a, a computer mind that's functionally equivalent to the human one, right? It's got all that complexity built into it, including capacities for higher order, self-referential thought and so on, would it be phenomenally conscious? Well, there it sort of depends upon whether, actually a question of metaphysics, are dispositions identical with their categorical bases or not? Some people think yes, some people think no. Because um, remember, in asking the question about phenomenal consciousness in another creature, one has to project one's own dispositions into that creature. Now. If dispositions are identical with their categorical basis, the categorical base in the human case is neuronal. The categorical base in the computer is going to be um, silicon. And so you can't put the one disposition into the other case. It'll be a different disposition, right? But maybe dispositions aren't identical with their categorical basis. Some people think they aren't, right? So a range of questions you could get excited about here if you want to, and I'm not gonna try and convince you. Why should I care, right? Why should one care? Who cares, right? Um, this is a, right. Um, so why should one care either about the marginal questions or about the question whether the cat is phenomenally conscious, the, the, the initial question that started off? Because remember, I've argued that there is no extra first person property to inquire about. Right? Um, suppose, for example, you know, that, that, that comparative psychology has advanced much further than, than it, its current state. And you've got complete knowledge of all the various processing systems and the contents in the mind of an infant or a chicken or a salmon or a honeybee, right? Any of those creatures, you, you know in complete, fully specified detail, a third person description of how its mind works and what it's currently experiencing or thinking. Um, nothing gets added to all that if phenomenal consciousness is present or not, on my view. On the view that I've defended, um, all you've got, right, sorry, nothing, nothing, lights up, there's no qualia at all, right? All you've got is functionally organized representational states with differences and similarities to our own. And there can be more or less similarity or difference from the states that give rise to the hard problem of consciousness in humans. There's no sharp point, there's nothing, no point at which a light gets turned on, there's just this gradation of functional differences. And for sure, that's worth studying. Comparative psychology is important. Right? It's important to understand what goes on in the mind of a honeybee or an infant. Right? Um, but I think the question of the exact distribution of phenomenal consciousness across creatures isn't. Right? 
um, there's, there's no substantive question there that needs to be answered. But last two slides now. <clears throat> you might say, what about moral significance? Doesn't, doesn't phenomenal consciousness matter for morals, for being a moral patient, the kind of thing that we ought to care about what happens to it? Um, and one way of getting into this is to think that you know, maybe sympathy for a creature requires imagining what it's like. Or empathy means a kind of fellow feeling with the other creature, right? So when you're empathic with someone's sadness, you feel sad too, right? It's, it's, you're, you've got a kind of mirroring emotional state. You, you both feel the same. And you might think, well, doesn't that require phenomenal consciousness? Well, to start with sympathy, I think, no. I mean, sympathy can just be grounded in third person understanding of goals and interests and often is, right? You can be sympathetic with someone who's um, going through something that's outside of your experience, right? That you yourself don't care about, um, but because they care about it, you can be upset that they're disappointed or that they haven't, um, aren't achieving the goals that they're trying to, to, to achieve and you can help them to try and achieve their goals. Right? I think even fellow feeling, empathy, doesn't require phenomenal feeling, doesn't require states that are phenomenally conscious. Um, all it means is co-entering the same um, emotional state. So no phenomenal concepts need to be employed or deployed. Um, when you think about what feeling states are, I think they carve into two distinct kinds of component. There's um, the positive or negative evaluation, the valence of the state, right? When someone's joyful, it's positive. When someone's um, grieving, it's negative, right? So it's positive or negative. And then there's representations of changes in the body of, um, often called arousal, um, heart rate, breathing rate, slumped posture, sensations of touch or pain, and so on. And you can tell that, I mean, you could share the evaluative component and share the sensations of touch and feeling without having to mention anything about phenomenal consciousness. Um, so in effect, it's just felt, meaning perceived states of the body. but some will push back, right? Um, this is a misquote from Jeremy Bentham, but um, it's the adaptation of the quote that Stephen Harnad, who is the um, editor now of the uh, Animal Sentience Journal, that's a new journal devoted to consciousness in animals. The question is not, can they think, but can they feel? Um, the original quote was, the question is not, can they think, but can they suffer? But Harnad has kind of generalized that to feel more generally. Um, and it's often thought, I mean, that question is thought to have an intuitive answer and it's thought that to feel, you've got to be phenomenally conscious, right? That that's what phenomenal consciousness is. It's the feel of experience, right? But I think actually there's a fallacy of ambiguity here that there's two uses of the term feel that are really quite different. And one is about phenomenal consciousness and one isn't. One is just about bodily perception. Um, so yeah, people often characterize phenomenal consciousness as mental states that have feel. It's a special kind of technical term, which I think is just a way of drawing your attention to this, right? The, the, the introspective property that you can identify using a phenomenal concept. Um, but feelings, felt, uh, felt states of the body, felt states of the body, and, and these are represented or perceived states of the body. So I'd want to say, look, cats, of course, have feelings, right? and cats can feel things, right? even if there's no fact of the matter whether their feelings have feel, right? So the cat can feel when you put pressure on its paw. So it feels that, it has the feeling of pressure on its paw, it represents it, right? But whether that perceptual state 
perceiving pressure on its pore itself has feel, right? Is phenomenally conscious is another question. And that can be the indeterminate, no fact of the matter one. And yet we can still say, as we surely want to say, that the cat feels pain, the cat feels pressure on its paw, and so on. Okay, so I, I, I don't think there's anything that this question matters for. You ought to just close down your colloquium, and go do something more useful, and, and stop caring about the question of phenomenal consciousness. <laughs>